Good morning. I'm Kate Snow in for Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, powerful plea, a potential turning point in the push for gun reform in America. This morning, emotional testimony expected in Washington after a surprise White House visit and a call to action by actor and Uvalde native Matthew McConaughey. So while we honor and acknowledge the victims, we, we need to recognize that this time, it seems that something is different. These regulations are not a step back. They're a step forward for civil society and, and the Second Amendment. Now lawmakers preparing for a high stakes hearing on Capitol Hill with those personally impacted by the recent mass shootings. We have team coverage with the latest as the call for change grows. Long road ahead, frustration growing with the rising cost of gas, and so far, experts say there's no end in sight. The everyday impacts now being felt by millions of Americans as more states join the $5 club. Final opinions. This morning, all eyes on the Supreme Court with dozens of decisions set to be delivered, a number of them as soon as today. We'll break down some of the biggest cases on the docket, including the one that could mean the end of Roe v. Wade. And C is for celebrating. On this World Oceans Day, we're paying tribute to the Earth's most massive bodies of water with the help of a former astronaut and, get this, aquanaut who's mm -hmm. lived in space and underwater, plus what you can do to help protect the deep blue sea. Isn't that crazy? In yeah. space and underwater? Yeah, and to, today, <laughs> what was the day? C, it's it's World, yeah, World C Ocean Day. Day. Ocean yeah, Day. I know. Well, who so knew? So we'll celebrate. That's I know, wonderful. right? And hey, so good, good morning. To have you with us. Good morning. I know. Welcome back from, <laughs> I haven't you. seen you since Italy. I know. I was on a little trip doing some some wedding stuff, which nice. was a lot of fun. Yeah, but nice. it's so fun to have you with us, Kate. It's and I have to be here. a long history. It's always fun when we get to spend time together. We're happy to have you with us at home, too. And we begin this morning with those growing calls for change when it comes to gun laws in this country. Bipartisan group of lawmakers is working to reach a deal by the end of the week. Meanwhile, a son of a victim of the mass shooting in Buffalo, as well as actor and Uvalde, Texas native Matthew McConaughey, made impassioned pleas for lawmakers to act. I'm here today in the hopes of applying what energy, reason, and passion that I have into trying to turn this moment into a reality. Because as I said, this moment is different. We are in a window of opportunity right now that we have not been in before. A window where it seems like real change, real change can happen. In a stark reminder of these tragedies, there is this gun violence memorial on the National Mall in Washington right now with more than 45,000 flowers, each one representing gun deaths. While inside the Capitol this morning, a House hearing where family members of Buffalo and Uvalde shooting victims are set to testify. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa joins me now. Uh, Ali, good morning. What can we expect from the hearing first off? Yeah, Kate, well, today, the second of two hearings this week featuring the family of the victims and the survivors of those two mass shootings in both Buffalo and Uvalde will testify. Uh, I want to play a clip, a particularly emotional clip, from the son of Ruth Whitfield, this 86-year-old woman who was killed at that Topps grocery store uh, in Buffalo a couple weeks ago. Listen to her son speaking yesterday at this hearing. What are you doing? You're elected to protect us, to protect our way of life. I ask every one of you to imagine the faces of your mothers as you look at mine and ask yourself, is there nothing that we can do? My mother's life mattered. My mother's life mattered. And your actions here today will tell us how much it matters to you. So we expect another day of emotional testimony, uh, both in person and virtually, from several people who will testify. We know uh, the one of the pediatricians that cared for so many of these children killed in that Texas mass shooting will testify, as well as the parents of one of the survivors. Uh, we also know that one of the fourth graders who survived, that girl that uh, smeared her best friend's blood all over her face and, and played dead uh, to survive, will also be testifying. Her parents say she's still suffering from, from nightmares uh, after that incident. And so uh, Chair, uh, Chairwoman Carolyn Maloney is saying that she hopes that the testimony we hear today will be a call to action for lawmakers in Congress who are still uh, kind of narrowing out the details of, of any sort of gun legislation reform package. 
Yeah, I have to tell you, I, I spoke with that man in Buffalo the day after the shooting about his mother, and he broke down in tears. I mean, I, I will never forget the moment I spent with him. Uh, we heard a little bit from actor and Uvalde, Texas native Matthew McConaughey a moment ago. It was part of an emotional speech that he gave, a really remarkable appearance inside the White House briefing room yesterday. There was a powerful moment when he talked about the shoes one of the young victims in Uvalde was wearing. Let's listen to that. Wore these every day. Green Converse with a heart on the right toe. These are the same green Converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her after the shooting. How about that? Can both sides rise above? Can both sides see beyond the political problem at hand and admit that we have a life preservation problem on our hands? We've seen such emotional pleas from actors, from lawmakers, parents, victims, school-aged children, like we've seen in Parkland, like I saw after Sandy Hook when I covered that massacre. Is this moment different? What's the latest on the negotiations in Congress? Well, senators hope that this moment is different. They've said publicly that they hope this is different from so many other past, as you mentioned, failed reforms. Uh, we know that these this group of originally nine senators has been whittled down to a group of four, and the buckets that they were considering have sort of shifted a bit. We know that instead of raising the minimum age to purchase an assault weapon from 18 to 21, we know that now they're considering uh, expanding some sort of system to uh, have juvenile criminal records accessible uh, when people between the ages of 18 and 21 try to purchase a gun. We know red flag laws as far as those negotiations, instead of a federal red flag law, uh, negotiators are considering a grant or incentive program for states to consider implementing those red flag laws, as well as several other things like hardening sec school security, uh, putting more money into uh, having some sort of federally protected mental health uh, program. and so. Negotiations are still being worked out. Senators say that they hope to reach a deal by the end of the week to hopefully vote on next week, Kate. All right, Ali Rafa, thanks so much. And in Uvalde this morning, there's more frustration and there are new demands for information from key officials who are saying little two weeks after the massacre at Robb Elementary. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is in Uvalde with the latest. Yeah, Kate Savannah, good morning. And hard to believe it has now been more than two weeks since this horrific tragedy struck Uvalde. And we are seeing an increased call for answers. The district attorney has now enlisted the help of two former DAs and two current DAs to sort through this massive investigation. This, as families in Uvalde demand the truth. We want facts and answers just. Inside an emergency city council meeting. It makes me feel real frustrated. Uvalde's mayor still demanding answers. Regarding transparency, Mayor, it's now been more than a week since there's been any public statement about this investigation. It's not, but, I don't, but again, I don't control deal. that side of it. You have to take that up with the district attorney. DA Christina Busby, now overseeing the investigation, has yet to speak publicly. Noticeably absent, newly elected council member Pete Arredondo, the school's chief of police. I can hear the gunshots. Angelia Rose Gomez rushed in when she says so police weren't acting quickly gunshots. enough. I just make my first way in. The I mother was captured on video, running away from the school after rescuing her sons. I didn't see not one cop running with me or not one cop run in there with me. They weren't doing nothing. They After sharing what she witnessed, Gomez said law enforcement called her, threatening obstruction of justice charges if she kept speaking out. Meanwhile, inside room 112, Arnulfo Reyes' class had been watching a movie. He told everyone to get under the table and pretend to sleep. He spoke with ABC News about his anger over how long it took for officers to move in. You have a bulletproof vest. I had nothing. There is no excuse for their actions. Reyes was shot three times. He says he prayed under the table, hiding with his 11 students. The shooter killed every single student in your classroom. Yes, ma'am. That's when I got you thinking, you know, this family lost one. This family lost one. I lost 11 that day. And I do it to my parents said, I'm sorry. I tried my best. 
of what I was told to do. Please don't be angry with me. Now, we did ask the mayor of Uvalde, when was the last time he personally spoke to Chief Arredondo? He says it was back when Texas Governor Greg Abbott visited Uvalde just days after the shooting. When I asked him if he had personally reached out to invite him to that city council meeting, the mayor told me he had not. We'll send it back to you. All right, Morgan Chesky, thank you so much. President Biden is traveling to Los Angeles today, where he'll deliver remarks at the inaugural ceremony of the Summit of the Americas. Despite some controversy over the guest list there, the White House says the president's looking to reassert U.S. leadership and curb China's influence in the region with a raft of new economic measures. NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee is following all of it for us. She joins us now. Good morning, Carol. Uh, so what more can you tell us about the agenda at the summit? What does he hope to accomplish there? Well, on the economic front, Kate, a number of things. The president's going to unveil what they're calling the America's Partnership. So it's a big economic initiative designed to spur trade in the region, to enhance the economic ties between the uh, different countries in the Summit of the Americas to deal with supply chain issues. There'll be health initiatives and also some $300 million in assistance to fight food insecurity in the region. So there's a big focus on the economic component of this. There's also a focus on migration and overshadowing this is that absence of a number of countries, Mexico boycotting the summit because the U.S. did not invite Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, and then others following suit, El Salvador, Honduras. And so there's a bit of a shadow over this. The administration's still hoping that some of the initiatives that they roll out will be effective nonetheless. All right. And migration, obviously the biggest issue on the table, at least for the U.S., which is seeing record numbers of migrants at the southern border right now. Uh, there's another caravan moving up through Mexico the U in, into the U.S., trying to get into the U.S. Vice President Harris has been tasked with addressing the root cause of immigration issues. What, what are we hearing from her at the summit? Well, she's really focusing on the economic issues, saying that the root cause is the reason why people are leaving their countries and trying to come to America is because of the economic conditions there. So the thinking being, if they can address some of those at home, then they can deal with the immigration problem, the migrant problem at the border. So she spoke to this a little bit yesterday. Take a listen. And when we provide economic opportunity for people in Central America, we address an important driver of migration. This investment is on track to generate, as a result of what we have done so far, tens of thousands of jobs, investments in sectors such as agriculture and textiles. One of the things, Kate, that they're going to unveil is this Los Angeles Declaration. So it's a it's focused on migration, and it basically says that it's how each of the countries in the region will share in dealing with the migration issue. Now, the question is, how long does this take? You mentioned that caravan. This is not something that's expected to be able to address those concerns immediately. All right, Carol, thanks for keeping an eye on it for all for for us. Thanks so much. Now, the November midterm ballots are taking shape this morning as primary election results from California and six other states come in. NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray has been following it for us, and he joins us now. Hey, Mark, good morning. So one of the most watched elections, it actually wasn't a primary, it was a recall vote. This was in San Francisco, the district attorney. What can you tell us about that? Uh, the district attorney, Chesa Boudin, got recalled and overwhelmingly by a 60 percent to 40 percent margin. In Savannah, you know, what is notable about this contest is if you've taken an isolation, you have one city district attorney getting recalled in the California election. You could say, hey, this is just a one election. But this comes after multiple members of San Francisco's uh, school board uh, ended up also getting recalled. And you can kind of take these two developments together as of some frustrations of a lot of reforms, mm. whether on schooling or on crime and hand, how a city handles crime. And voters are getting frustrated about their own governance, including and especially in cities like San Francisco. Let's stay in California. Now, I actually want to ask you about this expensive race for Los Angeles mayor. This is one that a lot of people are talking about. Representative Karen Bass, billionaire developer Rick Caruso came in for the top two. That means that they're going to meet for a runoff in the fall. But what can you tell us about this race, these two campaigns? Tell us what's interesting here. 
Yeah, I, what's really interesting is Rick Caruso. He's a former Republican turned Democrat who ended up spending nearly $40 million uh, to be able uh, to get to this runoff election. Um, and he is, and this kind of has some similarities to what we saw in San Francisco, He's been running against the homelessness in the city on the rampant crime there. Karen Bass that comes from the Democratic establishment of the Democratic Party. She was one of Joe Biden's vice presidential shortlisters. And this sets up a really fascinating general election runoff that we're going to end up seeing. And Savannah, I wouldn't be uh, surprised if we're going to end up seeing a lot of Karen Bass trying to litigate uh, Rick Caruso's former Republican ties. Yeah, former Republican until quite recently, just before John jumping into this race. So that is certainly an interesting one to watch. And I want to switch over to Iowa. So we kind of saw something of an upset in the Democratic race for Senate here. We had retired Admiral Mike Franken beat former Representative Abby Finkenauer. He'll now face incumbent Chuck Grassley, who handedly won the GOP nomination back in November. But what should we know about this race? Yeah. And so, Savannah, you are right that I think it's a slight surprise to a lot of people who followed politics, and particularly when Abby Fickenauer ended up getting elected in 2018 in that Democratic wave year. Uh, she had become kind of a well-known person from the Joe Biden wing of the Democratic Party. She ended up losing re-election in 2020. And what, it wasn't really that much of a surprise to me, however, because Franken ended up outspending her over the airways and ended up running, frankly, the better campaign. And Franken now will run against Chuck Grassley in the fall. Grassley, the Republican, uh, longtime Republican senator, mm -hmm. should be the overwhelming favorite, not only in, in the state like Iowa, which has been leaning Democratic over the last few years, but also in a national environment, which heavily favors the Republicans right now. All right. Lots to keep watching this primary season as we head into November. Mark, thank you so much. Well, this morning, the national average for the price of gas continues to climb toward the $5 mark, and some states have already passed that threshold. The price of diesel fuel rising at an even faster rate nationwide. These higher prices are not only having an impact on trucking, obviously it's also affecting consumer goods as well. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us now from Miami with the latest on the pain at the pump. It is painful, Sam. Good morning. There's nobody, Kate, good morning, that is not touched by this. You look over my shoulder, you'll see it's $4.99 at this gas station in Miami. And it's been like a bad waiting game as the country is just underneath $5 a gallon, Kate. The question this entire time has been, what's the breaking point? At what point does gas get so expensive? People just stop driving. And we are awfully close right now to finding out, as not surprisingly, this is hitting lower and middle class families the hardest. Record gas prices are being felt across the entire country. But California's pace setting 639 a gallon average could soon become America's reality with prices creeping up coast to coast. John Bonilla makes engineering house calls for a living. If you didn't have a corporate car to charge the gas on, how destructive would these prices be for you? I, I'm not sure that I, I would be able to, to work every day. Couldn't afford it. Last Friday, eight states sat above $5 a gallon on average. This morning, that's jumped to 16 states plus D.C., and the economic jolt is not felt equally. A new Bank of America report found household credit card spending for fuel surged to 7.8 percent by the end of May, but a whopping 9.5 percent for families making under $50,000. They call it inflation, but somebody's, somebody's pocket is getting inflated. We're the ones hurting down here, you know, the poor people, the, the working class. I mean, I work minimum wage job, so pretty much most of my paycheck goes to paying for my gas. Americans rocked by a double whammy, higher prices at the pump and in stores. Companies like Walmart and Target reporting disappointing first quarter earnings as many shoppers prioritize gas and groceries over home appliances and clothes. And diesel fuel has outpaced regular gas by a wide margin. It always comes out of the owner-operator's pocket. Fuel, maintenance, everything else. Tamim Shanab owns three 18-wheelers and transports frozen food and produce. He says he's spending seven or eight hundred dollars more a week on gas, and like many smaller truck operations, has seen employees flee. Because I can't afford to pay them what I used to pay, you know, in the past.
The fallout from fuel really touching, Kate, every corner of the economy. And AAA did a study recently asking consumers at what point would they stop driving. Three quarters of them said once gasoline reaches $5 a gallon, mm. it's expected to cross that threshold this week. So we are going to find out if that's going to become a reality. Yeah. Okay. Test in real time. Sam, thank you. Now let's take a look at your morning news now weather. Michelle Grossman joins us in the studio. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. So good to see both your faces you looking too. so good pretty morning. in your pink. Good morning. Pink I Wednesday. I know. I know. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Next Wednesday. I feel like I have pink on my ears. Oh, your lips. Oh, I don't. I, I don't. My lips. I, I do have pink earrings downstairs. I'll wear it next hour. Okay. All right. We are tracking more showers and storms today. We have that Monday, Tuesday. We're going to see more showers Thursday and Friday. This is what we're dealing with this morning. A strong complex of storms moving through parts of Kansas into Oklahoma and also Texas. You can see a lot of lightning here, hearing the thunder too. Seeing some heavy rain. You see some purple there. That could be indicating where some hail is falling as well. Heading to the northeast, we're looking at some soggy weather this morning. That's going to move out of here. We're going to get a little break and then more rain later on tonight. Also looking at the chance for more severe weather, 31 million people at risk today. We're looking at the risk for gusty winds up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail an inch or larger. That's enough to cause some damage to maybe take those cars indoors. And we're looking, or in, not indoors, into your garage. Don't take it indoors. We're looking at a few tornadoes as well. And this threat extends all the way from Oklahoma into the Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes, and also the Tennessee Valley into the southeast. We are looking at a severe threat once again on Thursday. With winds gusting up to 75 miles per hour, damaging hail up to two inches or larger, and a few tornadoes are possible as well. You can see it's over the same area, so we're seeing a potential of some flash flooding as well. Here is the setup. We have more days of storms. This is a third day this week. We're going to have two more, two more this week. We have those morning showers. They're going to be moving out, and then that severe threat throughout the central and southern plains later on this afternoon. Another round of rain in the northeast, and this is a big story too. Dangerous heat. Mm. 27 million people impacted in the south central states into the southwest and look at some of these temperatures over 100 degrees in so many spots we're going to see some records broken so 104 in del rio 102 in abilene 103 in el paso same stories we had throughout tomorrow 106 in tucson and by the weekend this is where it gets dangerous when it's so prolonged it's hard for our bodies to kind of handle that heat so phoenix we are looking at 114 on saturday and 113 Ooh. by sunday Ooh, that's hot. springs too I, yeah it's yeah, into the desert southwest yeah. too yeah, the California. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, what else is new? Something severe. Right. It never ends. Every day we're like, yeah, it's not day. a quiet day. Yeah. One day I'd like a map, which is a big yeah. sunshine. Yeah. Oh, All <laughs> good. Yeah. Not going to happen. Now to the latest on the war in Ukraine. Russia's military is continuing its push to control eastern Ukraine with a slow but relentless assault on Ukrainian troops. This as the Ukrainian government says more than 40,000 of their civilians have either been killed or injured since the invasion first started. Yeah. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins us now from Odessa, Ukraine. Ellison, good morning. Good to have you with us. Now, we know Ukrainian President Zelensky has said, I mean, multiple times, he will not give up any Ukrainian territory. Mm -hmm. And right now, Ukraine is not letting go of this key eastern city, one in particular, Severodonetsk. What's the latest on the situation there? Yeah, so Russia's defense minister claims that Russian forces now control 97 percent of Luhansk. That's one of two provinces that make up the Donbas region. Severodonetsk, the city you mentioned, there has been intense fighting, increasingly intense fighting in this city. But the governor of Luhansk, he has been adamant in saying that they will not give up that city to Russian forces. He says even if Ukrainian forces need to move outside of the city to take a more fortified position, that they will still continue this fight. President Zelensky in recent days, he talked about the idea of if they were to lose Severodonetsk, moving outside of the city and then launching some sort of counterattack moving inwards, he said that would be incredibly difficult and challenging and costly. He said it would cost five times the amount of equipment and lives in order to do something like that. Meanwhile, an advisor to President Zelensky told The Guardian today that they need more weapons. He said they need some 60 rocket launchers in order to keep Russian forces back. Remember, Weapons sent by the United States, they didn't come to Ukraine, all of them, as soon as Biden signed that age package. You have high-tech, medium-range rocket launchers like HIMARS that were stationed outside of Europe, and Ukrainian forces need three weeks to train on that. So initially, the question with those weapons was, will they get to the east quickly enough to make a difference? Now, Savannah, it seems the question is, will that type of aid, rocket launcher systems from the United States and other Western countries 
are they sending enough, mm -hmm. Savannah? Mm -hmm. And Allison, it's Kate. We're more than three months into this war now. What are you hearing from Ukrainians? Have attitudes changed from the start of the war to now? Yeah, they seem to be constantly evolving. We've actually been spending time in Odessa the last couple of days with artists, trying to get a sense of how their life, their art, has changed since the war began. Down here is Boris. He's one of the most well-known graffiti artists in Odessa. He said that some of his art has changed. You see what he's painting is Odessa with the colors of the Ukrainian flag. He actually started at the beginning of the war painting trucks, cars, camouflage for the Ukrainian army so they could take them to the front lines where necessary. We spoke to another artist, a really well-known painter from here, Ihor Gustev, and he told us that Ukrainian art in general now has a theme of death, a theme that they really didn't have at the start of this full-scale invasion and certainly not a theme that they were seeing a year, two, three years ago, at least not as strong as they are now. Listen to some of our conversation with that painter. This is the art that talks about death. In any, any environment, death is a taboo topic. It's a non-convenient Topic. And today is a vital topic for us. And all Ukrainian art right now is dedicated to death. And Boris was telling us that it can be difficult at times for him to find the inspiration, the will to paint in times mm -hmm. like these. He's been doing volunteer missions back and forth to Mykolaiv. But he also said for other people in the graffiti community, People who just use this as a bit of relief or expression, they can't do it right now because those cans of spray paint, incredibly hard to find. And when you can find them, incredibly expensive. One of the ripple effects, reminders of the challenges people pay, face in war. It's not just the threat to their safety, but the cost of everyday items from spray paint to boxes of rice. Absolutely. Kate, Savannah? Yeah, and quite something to see. An artist just continuing to paint despite everything that's mm -hmm. going on, just like we talked about yesterday. Mm -hmm. Quickly before I let you go, Alison, I do want to ask you about some of the fractures we've sort mm -hmm. of seen in the Western alliance over how to handle Russia moving forward. Is there a diplomatic option? Tell us the latest issue there. Yeah, I mean, you have some uh, European countries having this discussion about are they prolonging the conflict by sending too many weapons? Should they send less? Meanwhile, you have the UK agreeing to send a lot more just the other day. Emmanuel Macron, French, prime, uh, French president, the other day he talked about saying that it was important when this ends that Russia does not feel humiliated. That has not gone over well with Ukrainian officials here. They were very frustrated, disappointed with that statement, saying that they believe Russia are the ones who have humiliated themselves and that really the focus needs to be on beating Russia, ending this war, not in their view trying to appease them. But we're seeing these discussions, particularly among leaders in the European Union, about where do things go from here while you have Ukrainian military officials say they think Russia is trying to move this war into a protracted phase and that it could become a very lengthy, very bloody war. Savannah, Kate. All right, Ellison Barber, as always, thank you so much and stay safe. More international headlines now and breaking news out of Iran, where rescue crews are on the scene of a deadly train derailment. Yeah, NBC News global correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv with the latest developments on that and the other stories making headlines around the world this morning. Hey, Raf. Savannah, Kate, good morning. Iranian state media says at least 21 people have been killed in that train crash in eastern Iran. Authorities say the speeding train collided with an excavator that was on or near the track, sending it flying off the rails. A major recovery effort is underway, including helicopters, and officials are warning the final death toll may rise higher still. Japan is getting ready to welcome back international visitors after two years of closed COVID borders. Starting Friday, foreigners can enter the country if they're part of a package tour. Interestingly, domestic tourism is actually a bigger part of Japan's economy than international tourism. 
And finally, the heat is on to find the best pizza in the Western Hemisphere. Argentina is playing host to the second Pan American Pizza Tournament. Pie makers from across the region are competing in front of a jury of journalists, chefs, and cooks to make the tastiest pizza in the Americas. There's a little dough for the winner, around $8,000 in prize money. And guys, we at NBC, obviously very into the Olympics, but we have got to start covering this. I would volunteer to fly down there. I mean, they, they must need, need taste testers, right? right? Right. And I know I'm sitting in New York, so this is this is going to be shocking, but Chicago deep dish. Oh. Mm, no. I mean, it's it's not bad. No pizza is bad, but I'm more of a New York style. I mean, I just came from Italy. What am I saying? That's where it's <laughs> Italian pizza. Yeah. Raph, thanks so much. Thanks, Raph. Appreciate it. The Supreme Court has nearly a month left in its term to decide on the remaining 30 cases on its docket, and some of those are expected to come this morning. The unusually large caseload has the justices racing to put some of the finishing touches on several highly anticipated rulings, including on gun safety, immigration, and, of course, the future of abortion rights in the U.S. All eyes now on the Supreme Court with the political future of the U.S. unclear. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now on set for more on this. Danny, good morning. Always good to have you with us. So we love for you to help us kind of with some context here. And I think particularly with this one we keep talking about that deals with abortion rights, it's kind of been put just in that context, Roe versus Wade, abortion rights. But let's step back. And if you could remind us how this particular case, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, made it to the Supreme Court in the first place, and then walk us through what could immediately start happening if we are to get that ruling. Well, in all likelihood, Dobbs arrived at this Supreme Court because once the Supreme Court reached its very conservative makeup, uh, conservative-minded state legislatures were sort of like when the Delta Force is rappelling out of a helicopter, they were like, go, go, yeah. go, pass these abortion laws and bring mm -hmm. them up to this Supreme Court because these justices are the most likely to take a new look and overturn Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. And that's how we arrive here. The court, as we've already seen in a spoiler alert, is going to consider whether or not, first, Roe was egregiously wrong, and secondly, even if it was wrong, should stare decisis uh, mm. promote the respect for precedent or should precedent be overturned? Mm. Another one that we want to talk about, uh, which could have big implications for climate change mm -hmm. and emissions in this country, the justices yeah. agreed to hear this case regarding the EPA's ability to regulate carbon emissions. Where did that come from and what could that mean? Yeah. So in this case, the Supreme Court is deciding to what degree can the EPA control or regulate or protect the environment by agency rulemaking. Now, this is an issue Justice Gorsuch has taken up many times in his career, which is essentially that agencies, by making rules, essentially make law without the democratic process. It's just some functionary in an office making a regulation. And the issue here is how far outside of a plant can the EPA regulate the environment? And the Supreme Court has to make that decision in this case. Let's keep going through some of the big topics here that these will touch on. Two cases involving religion and education. Tell us what's sort of the heart of those cases and how those made it there. In the first case, uh, the court is going to decide whether or not uh, when a state or municipality funds a private school, does it also have to fund a religious school? In other words, is it required to be fair to both private schools mm. and religious schools? But the second case fascinates me. I was a, a high school coach many moons ago, and this is an issue where a coach was supposedly, and the facts are disputed, was uh, leading a prayer at, at the 50-yard um, mm -hmm. line after a football game. Now, the way, I have to say, the way the coach frames it, you'd almost think he was muttering it to himself privately at the 50-yard mm -hmm. line. That doesn't appear to be the case. There are photographs of him leading a prayer with other students and players around him, and the court has to decide whether or not that is protected religious freedom or if it infringes upon the First Amendment and the separation of church and state. And lastly, what would the Supreme yeah, Court <laughs> say about Chicago versus okay. New York this is, pizza? This is not even the biggest controversy. What, the biggest controversy is Kate Snow's uh, apparently support of Chicago deep dish pizza over other pizzas. Now, as I, a, I don't disagree. I with am that, calling for you to hand over to your New York driver's license <laughs> on behalf of the Bar Association. I'm here to collect it, to revoke it, and you can start uh, talking like a Chicagoan. You can mm -hmm. say pizza, no, yeah, and all that other My stuff. My mother-in-law is Kathy. Kathy, exactly right. You know, it's my, over. 
<laughs> my whole extended family's from Chicago, just for the record. So There's got to be right somebody now. watching out there who's with me on the deep dish. It's how, you know what it is? It's Wonder Bread with sauce okay. piled okay. on top. <laughs> that that's is so it. True. That is all it is. It's outrageous. That's a good way to put it. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Also, what did you coach? Uh, lacrosse. Oh, we were nine and one. I just want that. You look that up, fact checkers. Never That's knew that funny. about yeah. Danny Savalas. Gosh, Danny. That's something new every time. Danny Savalas, thank you so much for stopping by. Yeah, appreciate <laughs> it. All right, we have to change gears here. As the dust settles from the immediate aftermath of the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary in Texas, one group is working overtime to help schools move forward now. NBC News Now anchor Hallie Jackson talked to principals bonded by tragedy, and she asked them, is it even possible to recover? When former Columbine principal Frank DeAngelis heard about the massacre in Uvalde, he picked up the phone and left a voicemail for the principal of Robb Elementary. I guess I was pretty naive back in April of 99. I made the comment within 24 hours. I said, I hope my beloved 13 uh, do not die in vain, you know, and that this does not happen again. And unfortunately, it continues to happen. It's part of his work with the Principal Recovery Network, a group he helped found of school leaders who experienced gun violence. They offer help right away and support to principals who lead schools that have encountered shootings. Why do you think the Principal Recovery Network helps and is useful in a moment like this? Well, I think a lot of times one of the things that was kind of a trigger for many of us is principals or teachers stating that I know what you're feeling and you're trying to say, do you really? You know, were you stuck in a classroom? Did you encounter a gunman? More than 311,000 students have been exposed to gun violence during school hours since Columbine happened, according to the Washington Post. And now the Uvalde shooting has spurred the network to write an open letter to elected officials saying, we beg you, do something, do anything. But without policy changes, more schools are being forced to figure out themselves how to, for example, reopen after a shooting. Really, we have to kind of let them take the lead in talking about it. So it is appropriate to, to ask questions. How are you feeling? Are you, you know, are you feeling okay? Are you feeling safe? That's maybe the biggest challenge to recovery. How do you get students to feel safe in school again after they've experienced something as horrific as a mass shooting? Is that even possible? Well, it is difficult. And one of the things that I learned is afterwards, you want the kids to feel safe. You want the parents to make sure that they feel safe having the kids there. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you do not have things in your building that are triggering the emotion and anxiety. For the students at Columbine, that meant, for example, changing the sound of the fire alarm and choosing to stop serving Chinese food in the cafeteria because that's what they had for lunch the day the shooting happened. But it's different for each school, and there's no blueprint for recovery. There are a lot of decisions that had to be made in that moment, what to do with the space, how to move forward with the school culture. Elizabeth Brown became the principal of Forest High School in Ocala, Florida, in 2018, just 45 days after a student who'd been expelled hurt a classmate with a sawed-off shotgun before it jammed. She and Greg Johnson are also members of the network. He's the principal of West Liberty Salem High School in Ohio, where he convinced a gunman to drop his weapon after shooting a student at school back in 2017. If you look at fully recovered, meaning you're going back to the way it was before, uh, no, I don't, I don't think that's possible. But you do get your feet back under you maybe as a, as a school and as a community, and you, you reestablish that new normal. These principals, brought together by the trauma of leading through horrific circumstances, also had practical matters to deal with. What to do on the first anniversary of a shooting or how to approach graduation. We hate to add new members to the group. We just don't want this to happen to any other principal. In a sign of the times, with gun violence threatening schools across the country, the network is set to release a guide for other principals. It'll be out later this summer, ahead of the next school year. Unfortunately, we've seen over the past few decades, it could happen in any communities, large communities, small communities, rural communities, and we just need to be there to support. Our thanks to Hallie Jackson for that report. Frank DeAngelis, by the way, left a message for the principal of Robb Elementary, but has not been in contact with her yet. He says this is pretty normal. They're trying to get through the memorial services and things of that nature. DeAngelis is hoping within the next week or so that he will be able to speak with that principal. Now, with a recent survey that shows the vast majority of U.S. hospitals are not complying with a federal law requiring them to post their prices publicly, NBC News correspondent Katie Beck explains what's now being done to try to hold them accountable. Life for the past year has been an uphill climb to clear medical debt for Jason and Deanne Dean. The moral of this story is that you have to be prepared to walk into a hospital. 
Jason injured his knee last May. He went to a local hospital where he says he was told he'd need stitches. The cost of his care should have been posted online under the federal hospital price transparency rule. Jason hadn't heard of it. He says he was told his insurance would cover everything. Weeks later, a bill came for $6,500. And what was your reaction seeing I couldn't believe, I thought it was a joke. Insurance covered some of it, but left Jason owing more than $3,000. Hospitals have been able to keep patients in the dark. Cynthia Fisher, founder of patientrightsadvocate.org, is on a mission to stop scenarios like Jason's. Nowhere else in our economy do we not get prices in advance of purchase. The hospital price transparency rule, born as part of the Affordable Care Act, took effect in January of 2021. Presidents Obama, Trump, and Biden have all openly supported it. It requires health systems to publicly post the cost of their items and services online, standard charges, and also by health insurance plan, showing patients what they can expect to pay, giving them power to shop and compare. How dramatic could the result be? Oh, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. That unleashes competition. It unleashes a market. But a recent report from Fisher's group, based on a study of 1,000 hospitals, found a year in only 14 percent of U.S. hospitals were complying with the rule. Roughly 85 percent of hospitals are non-compliant. That is correct. When asked to respond to Fisher's report, the American Hospital Association said it supports price transparency and believes patients deserve the best possible information. The Federal Department of Health and Human Services enforces the rule and can fine hospitals up to $5,000 a day for being in violation. We will do ro robust enforcement. HHS sure Secretary that, uh, Javier Becerra promised accountability for hospitals at his confirmation. The buck stops with you. You're the secretary. Have you issued any fines? We have issued several hundred warnings. Uh, we have to go through the process. I think a lot of people's complaint is that this is a federal law, but it has no teeth. Well, the, remember, those teeth just grew out. No fines issued yet. Becerra says he needs the public's help to get non-compliant hospitals to follow the rules, helping people like the deans make informed decisions. Can you assure those people that in the future there is going to be a different way of doing things? There already is a different way of doing things. We just have to, have to accelerate it so everyone knows it. There's got to be a new sheriff in town. And you're telling them you're the new sheriff? Well, if I can implement this the right way, then I'll walk into Dodge and try to do something about it. Hi, Neo. Until then, Americans' right to know the cost of their care before they receive it remains a law largely ignored. Katie Beck, NBC News, Washington. Let's stay on important health news for you with your weekly checkup where we discuss the latest health headlines that you might have missed. And today we're joined by our friend, NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Hi, Dr. Patel. It's great to have you. So this first study we want to talk about looks at how weight loss surgery might be helping obese people slash their risk of cancer and death. Tell us about this and how many people is this really affecting? Yeah, this is an important study, Savannah, and it was critical to understand that there are a lot of common cancers, such as breast cancers, gynecologic cancers, that this pattern was seen in, where in patients who are obese, having surgery to reduce their obesity actually also helped reduce their chances of getting these important cancers. And I think the key takeaway, because it's not practical and probably even an option for anybody who is obese to have surgery first. So I think the key takeaways for at least anybody listening is that treat obesity for what it is, a really complex disease and acknowledge that it can be a risk factor for other things such as cancer and that there are other options to treat obesity, including medications, and lifestyle modifications, and seek out those treatments before doing anything else. Don't suffer alone. It's a disease just like anything else, and we mm. need to be better at acknowledging and treating it. Mm. Dr. Patel, we also have a new study out of Memorial Sloan Kettering mm -hmm. Cancer Center that, that shows some pretty remarkable results, as I understand it, 100% remission in rectal cancer in patients who used targeted immunotherapy. R remind us what that is and what does that tell us? Yeah. Yeah, Kate, I, I have a smile. This is a, a close friend of mine who led that study. And I'll tell uh -huh. you, persistence is key. And this is a story for all patients to listen to. So rectal cancer rising in terms of incidence occurs in younger people, not as rare as one might think that we make over 45,000 diagnoses of rectal cancer every year, and that's probably an underdiagnosis. It's something that traditionally has very harsh treatment, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, 
What targeted immunotherapy is, in short words, is really taking something that is not radiation surgery or chemotherapy and teaching your immune system to target just the cancer cells. It's exactly what we're trying to do with other cancers and including with what we do with vaccines for COVID. So it's teaching your own body to target mm. the cells that are bad and learn how to fight them. And in 12 patients at Sloan Kettering in this trial, they saw 100% remission. It is stunning wow. front page headline news. <laughs> and what it shows us is that there's a possibility in the future that the three of us will be talking and we'll be able to talk about this curing many cancers. Wow. So it's incredible. Hope and so. advocate for yourself. If you're a patient, don't hesitate to get a second opinion. Mm. The doctor's order here is that it's never a final order seek out opinions, seek out other advice, clinical trials, and things that could help you understand your total option. Amazing. And I think we saw that headline and thought, wow, that sounds like a big deal. And it's great to hear that it actually it is. is. And, and congratulations it to is. your friend running that study. Yeah. Last quick one for you. This is really cool. It looks at how people with higher levels of optimism actually lived longer. So tell us, I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> It, oh, look, I, I, I would love to say that I had the cure for everything that, that could help someone live to the age of 100, but this is actually something that has now been studied over decades, studied in broad populations, diverse racial and ethnic populations, and even controlling for lifestyle, all the things you would think of that help you live longer. Optimism, having a great attitude can actually keep you alive longer. And mm. here's the takeaway for, for me and for anybody watching and listening come into things with kind of a glass half full attitude. And that includes decisions about your health. Try to find the good news. You and I are talking right now because we have some great news in healthcare. Mm. When someone hears <laughs> a diagnosis of cancer, instead of going to the negative, think about what we just talked about with cures and incredible results. So that optimism, even with other risk factors controlled, can help you live longer. So to take it all away, Let's just all start today with a different attitude, and we know it'll help us decades from now. That is love great it. to hear. I know. I love it, too. Dr. Kavita Patel, we always love when you join us. Thank you. Now, look, we all have a smile on our face. That's good, right? <laughs> Welcome back. There's a once in a generation thing happening up in the sky this month. Earth's five closest planets will appear in a row for the rest of June. About a half hour before sunrise, sky watchers can see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn stretch across the sky in a diagonal formation starting low in the east. It's what astronomers call a conjunction, and this one happens only once every two decades. And the best opportunity to see this planetary party will be on June 24th. And the planets will shine brighter than any star so you actually won't even need a telescope to see it which is pretty cool it's fantastic yeah and actually you've got somebody here who could probably talk about Tell a little bit better about, about, about this yeah actually though today's world oceans day as we said so that's where we're starting that's today not just to celebrate the world's waters but to remind people of the importance of protecting the oceans and its resources okay so let's bring in our guest she knows a lot about the planet she's seen it from space nasa yes. astronaut <laughs> exactly. jessica meyer is here with us she's based she's in new york right now because she's being named to the 2020 time 100 list congratulations for the first all women spacewalk. Amazing. Right? You also happen to have a PhD in marine biology. I do. So yes. thank you very much. Wow. We're, <laughs> and we're, we're a little blown away by yeah. you. So, <laughs> so World Ocean Day. Tell us tell us about exploring the world's oceans and how you see the state of our oceans right now. Well the oceans are a vital part of our mm. climate system. And as you know, the climate is in crisis. So so are the oceans. Mm. There are a lot of things that you can do to help right here locally and all around the world. For example, there's the Billion Oyster Project here in New mm -hmm. York, which is restoring New York's coral reefs, or sorry, New York's oyster reefs. And that is in collaboration with the community. I was going to segue to corals next. So corals <laughs> are, they actually house one third of the biodiversity in the oceans. And that is a huge component of all of these different types of animals and plant species. And so what you can do to protect them, anything that you can do to help protect the climate, for example, food waste. Food waste produces methane, and that is one of the principal contributors to to mm. climate change, as we know. So less food waste, clean energy choices, all of these things that you can do at home, your choices really do matter. So get out there and help protect the oceans. I can tell you, having mm. had that privilege of seeing our planet and its remarkable beauty, including all of the oceans from above, you can just tell how much 
how fragile our planet yeah. is, how it really, we really do need to protect it. It is special and it really is completely fragile. So we all need to do our part mm. in protecting it for all the future generations to come. Absolutely, yeah. such a good message. I think the other thing, I mean, we mentioned you're an astronaut, but also <laughs> an aquanaut. I mean, right? Is this that's, a, right. that's a real term. Yes. Tell us, I mean, you lived in an underwater habitat. I don't even know how to ask a question about this because my mind is so blown by that concept. Tell us about that, what you learned, what it was like to really be so immersed literally in that. Yeah, one of the things that we do to help train as we are astronauts is find other environments that are kind of like space. You know, we can't wow. replicate all of the things of space down here in the ground. So if you find an environment that maybe it's an isolated, confined setting, you need a life support oh. system to go outside, that kind of thing. So what we do is we actually train in an environment called, um, it's called the NEMO project, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations. So we have these missions where we live underwater in an underwater habitat, and that wow. really does replicate a lot of the same things that we have in space. You're in a small enclosed habitat with a small group of people. You have a list of scientific objectives to accomplish. You need that life support system to go outside. So I was fortunate enough to do one of those missions actually well before I was an astronaut. It was back in 2002 that I did my mission in the Aquarius habitat. Mm. And I was a scientist at NASA then. It was before I went to grad school. Um, and now we do use it for astronaut training, but also for testing hardware and scientific experiments, that kind of thing. So wow, amazing. Uh, so good to have you here today yes. on World Oceans Day. Thank yes. you so and much. Thank you for all those tips, things that people can all be doing at home to do their part. Jessica, so impressive. Thank you and have fun. Congrats on the time. All right, absolutely. List. Wonderful to be here. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thanks for joining us. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.